How many of you have been tagged in an embarrassing picture on social media? We probably all have. I certainly have. Here are just a few examples. <laughs> this one is from a photo booth at a holiday party. This one is from my prom night. And I have no idea where this one is from and how it made it to social media, but I did get my friend's permission to share it with you here today. As you can see, most of the content shared online is quite harmless. It might be embarrassing or uncomfortable for a few hours or a few days, but then we get over it. Unfortunately, this isn't always the case. Sometimes the content shared online can cause serious harm. Take the example of Molly Russell. She was a 14-year-old girl in the UK who died from an act of self-harm after suffering depression and the negative effects of online content. Or the case in the US, where a man was watching the sexual abuse of a seven-year-old girl on a video conferencing application. Or the case where a terrorist was live streaming his shooting rampage on a social media platform. Now you might be wondering whether issues like these are really such a big problem. So let me share a few data points. Over half of girls surveyed in a, in a survey by Plan International have experienced online harassment. And this problem is only getting worse. There's been a doubling in women who've experienced online sexual harassment since 2017, according to the Pew Research Center. African-American respondents to a survey by the Anti-Defamation League reported a sharp rise in race-based harassment online, from 42% in 2020 to 59% in 2021. And when it comes to children, there's been a 64% increase in URLs containing or advertising child sexual abuse material from 2020 to 2021, according to the Internet Watch Foundation. I could go on and on, but the gist is that harmful and illegal content is a sizable and growing problem. So why is this the case? Well, firstly, it is easier than ever before to share content and connect with people with niche ideologies. Let's take the example of online extremism. Jigsaw, a unit within Google which explores threats to open societies, interviewed former white supremacists who were radicalized online. They went from discovering ideas about white supremacy to actively advocating for them within the span of three to six months. So not only is it easy to find this content, but for some people, it can take almost no time to become fully bought into these ideologies. The terrorist who entered a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, killing 51 worshippers and live streaming this on social media was part of the same online white supremacist network as the shooter who entered a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. Both posted similar warning messages to their online communities. In fact, the first sentence of the Texas shooter's online manifesto communicated his support for the Christchurch shooter. So as you can see, this becomes a hateful and vicious cycle, whereas more violent content is posted online, it can draw in and incite others to do the same. This, unfortunately, the same platforms that allow us to connect over food, travel, cute animals, or other innocent interests can also connect communities of extremists or those with other harmful ideologies. This is especially true on platforms that do not have or enforce policies against violent extremism or other such harms. Secondly, there are financial incentives for harmful content to be created and distributed. Bad actors may create sensationalist content for clicks in the hopes of attracting advertiser revenue. Then there are the cases of scammers who use harmful content to exploit people in crimes such as extortion. In one case in the US, a man posing as a young girl sent a nude image to a teenage boy asking for an explicit image in return. 
Once this teenager sent a nude image of himself, the cyber criminal demanded $5,000 or threatened to make the photo public. Only a few hours later, this 17-year-old boy committed suicide. Unfortunately, cases like this are not an anomaly. Over a quarter of sextortion cases led to suicide or attempted suicide, according to a report by the FBI. So clearly, these financial incentives have serious consequences. Lastly, all platforms are different. They have different policies and ways of enforcing them. They cover different geographies, languages, and have different accuracy and effectiveness of their enforcement. Given that all platforms are different, they have different users, product features, and are of different maturities and sizes, this makes sense. However, it does lead to divergent practices in the industry as to how harmful content is tackled. So with all this in mind, how can we think about innovating and improving when it comes to digital safety? Well, the first is to take a proactive approach. What I mean by this is building the tools, processes, and capacities to anticipate and act on risk to safety before they occur. An example is a recently launched tool that allows anyone who is worried about a nude image of themselves, a non-consensual intimate image, being shared online to flag this proactively. A site called stopncii.org will create a hash or a digital fingerprint of the image or video on your device that you are worried about sharing. Participating platforms will then match against this database of hashes for any content that is attempting to be uploaded onto their platforms and will block these proactively if that is indeed a violation. Tools like this, which take an innovative approach that focus on preventing harm, not just responding to harm, will be key to the future of online safety. Secondly, incentivizing companies to build in safety into their products from the onset is another opportunity. Today, when investors fund tech companies, they focus on metrics such as the size of the user base or the growth of the platform over time. What if one of the considerations was the ability of the platform to respond to reports of harmful content? What if there was a meaningful checklist based on industry standards that allowed investors to evaluate a company's digital safety capability as there is for privacy and cybersecurity? A set of industry standards for content governance could help. For example, should all platforms of a certain size have a process for escalating content review decisions to an external oversight board? Or should all platforms of a certain type endeavor to consult academic or civil society experts when updating their policies in a certain harm area? Industry standards could put forth a joint perspective on questions such as these. Lastly, one of the biggest opportunities for improvement is how we measure safety online. Are we measuring the right things in the right ways? For example, today, metrics such as the number of pieces of harmful content re removed or viewed on a platform make it difficult to assess if things are getting better over time. For example, if this month, 100 pieces of hate speech are removed off a platform, and next month, 200 pieces are removed. Does that mean that the platform got better at detecting this type of content? Or was it simply that more of this type of content was being created and posted on its platform? It isn't easy to dissect the key components of online safety metrics today. In sectors such as film or advertising, there are industry standards with associated rating scales. While, of course, user-generated content on digital platforms is far more complex, nuanced, and diverse, a set of standards for creating content policies and enforcing those policies could be the basis for more consistent measurement. It may sound overly simplistic, but in order to improve, we all need to agree on what we are trying to improve, 
and what it takes to get there. While of course, this is all easier said than done, I am optimistic that while we may all still have moments of embarrassment or discomfort online, we can drive real innovation when it comes to online safety. Thank you for your time. <laughs>